That's okay. Uh, so before I start, can you hear me? Uh, I have a question up here. This is my first question. All right, if, to imagine a galaxy in your head and uh, keep that mental picture in your mind. Uh, I'll come back to this question. Uh, all right, so this is my original title. Uh, I, what I intend it to mean is that uh, uh, these three things here uh, have a complicated interplay and but I realize I don't probably have time to talk about all three, so I just focus on the last one. If you want to learn about the first two, I refer you to Andres and Oscar's paper. And all of these papers, including the CGM, CGM paper, are published, so you can look up the references here. All right, so I'm going to change my title to be the structural properties of the CGM. Uh, okay, so my second question to you is, uh, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, this is in 1970s, the first Star Trek poster, right? Uh, the, the answer to the, my second question is, there are no clouds, right? And they're supposed to travel into galactic space. So referring to my first question, right? Uh, did you imagine any clouds in your galaxy? Maybe, maybe Eric did. <laughs> uh, anyway, so clouds are important. Um, uh, here, uh, we have run this. Uh, series of simulation varying the star formation efficiency and feedback parameters on the left here uh, oops we have a star formation C of 10 percent and on the right hand column we have a one percent and just increase the supernova energy by five times right and just at first glance you can tell that the uh, structure are very different the first one uh, have a nice rotating disk but there's not a lot of coal gas in the halo and in contrast, the, this here is destroyed, but the uh, CGM is more extended, which is what we want more or less in the CGM community, because we, uh, in a lot of C, uh, simulations. Right? So this is the quantity to plot, uh, what I just said. Uh, so here are the blue points of all the data I compile. Uh, you can look at the references there. Right? I'm plotting the column density as a function of the scale impact parameter. Right, so the one on the left is the 10%, uh, and the other one is 1%, but with boosted feedback, more energetic feedback. And what I want you to pay attention to is this gap here in this model. Right, it fails many orders of magnitude. It's not able to get it up to the halo in large distances, but this one get it just fine. Right, so this is my first point. I want to make three points in this talk. The first one is. The CGM is sensitive to star formation and feedback models. It is extremely useful to constrain these models. All right? And there's are spoilers for the second and third point. Uh, all right, so uh, see uh, Drummond's talk as well. Uh, this is just uh, different ions, right? silicons, in addition to H1 and others. Uh, during our analysis, one interesting thing we found is that if you just fit an exponential profile to this, right, um, in this form, you, uh, we, we, we can see that it follows very well with the simulation. Right? And we, I, so I went and go to the literature and check and, uh, what is the actual profile. So this is one example of the uh, observed data of magnesium-2 in New Zealand at all 2013. Right? This is the green one is the power law and the curved one, curvy one, is the exponential profile. So the upper limit really tell you is it has to drop very quickly. Right? This is for magnesium-2, right? It's not unique to magnesium-2. There's also H1 and carbon-4 in the other uh, studies. All right? And another interesting thing is that if you fit this exponential profile, you get a number other than the normalization. You get a scale height, Hs, here, right? If I draw your eye closer attention here, silicon-4 has a higher, larger scale height. And it's larger than silicon-3 and it's larger than silicon-2. Right? The more ionized gas is, the more extended they are. Right? And you can even visually see this, right? You can visually see this. This is magnesium 2, carbon 4, and O6. Okay? If you plot this scale height for each and every ion that you have, right? in simulation we can have all of them, and you can, they follow this scale height as a function of their ionization energy, their potential to take away the electron. Uh, you get this tie correlation. It's a power law. It turns out, and I went uh, out and checked our other simulation, 
uh, Cameron Humboldt's 2013 and Ford et al. 2015 or any simulation, there are this kind of gen, uh, generic behavior. So if you have your simulation, I urge you to check this uh, as well. All right, so this is carbon-234 that we have data for, and silicon, and this is oxygen-6. Right. This is my second point. The column densities are exponential in form, and they're the onion-like. Right. So you can tell what I mean by onion, because if you just plot the oxygen profile, this is O1, O2, O3, and so on. So it looks like an onion. This is on average, right? So this is, this is you know, the picture of what I mean. Okay, so lastly, the last point I want to hit is the CGM is self-similar, right? And it's in the following sense, right? So if you just plot a uh, usual equivalent width of, say, carbon-4 against some raw impact parameter, right? So you have a bunch, bunch of data points here, so bear with me. So this is ratio of two of Seidel points. This is uh, Liang and Chen, my previous paper with Xiao Wen, and uh, Baudelaire 2014, the ratio of zero using HST data. And the red histogram here is the simulation points that we have in, in, with Andre and Oscar. And this exponential profile is a fit to the simulation, not to the data. Right? It goes right through them. Okay? So some has mentioned that the CGM evolves very mildly. It doesn't change very much since rest up 2. Right? So that's the first point. Second, if you want to compare apples to apple, because all these galaxies have different masses, you want to scale them correctly with the real radius, right? So once you do that, the scatter in this plot shrink, right? That's first. Second, the green points get shifted away, right? So I, I was kind of bumped, like, what is going on here? But in, in fact, we can understand this is R of year gets smaller at uh, ratio of two, just because it, the definition of R of year it is referencing the background density, right? Um, you can understand that using this plot, right? So this, this is the evolution of the radius of a halo uh, going from ratio of, uh, 7 to 0. Uh, R of year goes like this. Uh, four times the scale radius, where scale radius is defined as the NFW profile from the NFW profile, right? They track each other pre what until a ratio of 2, and then they deviate. And this deviation of R of year is due to so, what's so-called pseudo-evolution, right? It's evolving even without accreting matter. And we don't want that. CGM is only living in the inner halo part. That's why the scale radius is a better radius to use. So uh, to get the scale radius, you use the mass concentration relation, right? And then compute that and just divide D bit divided by RS. The lo and behold, the green points shift it back in here, right? And then this is what I mean by uh, the CGM is self similar, right? And all this data, by the way, is, is across four orders of magnitude in stellar mass from dwarf galaxy to L star, even more massive galaxies. And this is from, you know, uh, about 10 billion years. Okay, so I hope that in this talk I deliver a message that you have your updated picture of the Earth uh, and as well as the galaxy, uh, that there are clouds and the clouds are important. Uh, so I will just leave my summary up here. All right, thanks. Questions? Just real quick, what are the gray points that are so far shifted to the right? Uh, th these, are, these gray points are whoops, uh, upper limits, they're non-detections, so, which, is, which is great because well, as soon as you uh, scale by RS, all the gray points that used to be, oops, I can never get this clicker correct. The gray points are used to be right below the blue points, but once you do it correctly, the upper limit is shifted to the right as well. So it makes sense. David? Uh, there's some hints that at least for lots of galaxies, the structure of the outflows might be somewhat biconical or, or isometric, etc. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in your simulations. I'm wondering whether your structure of the feedback from the middle has something to do with it, whether you include within disks rather than from a, a, yeah, an AGN so, or something like that. So we don't have AGN in our simulation. Uh, uh, what the feed, what's doing the work is the uh, boosted feedback of uh, star, uh, star formation and uh, uh, star formation feedback. 
it's not by conical because it's so energetic, right? Usually it leaves in the, maybe in the path of least resistance, maybe that's why it's uh, bipolar, but these are so energetic, it can blow in every which way. Okay, uh, let's move on. Thank, let's right. thank Cameron again. And <laughs>